Hello there. I have read The Makioka Sisters by Yunichiro Tanizaki, and it is wonderful. It is beautiful, and it is pure literature. This is a long book. This book is 530 pages, and you can feel it. I don't mean that it is bad. I don't mean that it is difficult to read. It is not in any way difficult to read. It, it flows along. It's just that it is very much like reading about real life. So let us begin with one of the critical things to understand about the Makioka sisters, and that is the names of the four sisters. To begin the book, thankfully, we have this, the principal characters, which I don't know about you, but I found myself turning back to that page often. Not so much for the four sisters. The four sisters were easy enough to, to figure out, and they have sharply defined personalities. It was more the husbands and the children. Sister one is Tsuruko. Tsuruko. So she is the mistress of the senior or the main house in Osaka. And I'm going to talk more about that idea of the main house a little bit later. I did a course at university about Japanese culture, and I learned a lot about this idea. I was happy to read this and to feel that something I learned at university had direct application to, you know, what I'm reading. Sister two, Sachiko. The mistress of the junior, or branch house, in Ashiya, a small city just outside of Osaka. For reasons of sentiment and convenience, the younger unmarried sisters prefer to live with her somewhat against tradition. Tsuruko is in the main house, and she is the main sister. Sachiko is the second sister, and her family is a little bit removed. And now the two, the next two sisters should by rights, be living at the main house, but they prefer not to be. They, they prefer more to be with the second sister. The third sister is Yukiko. Three of the four sisters, we get quite a lot of their lives. However, Yukiko does seem to be the one that most of the plot is centered around, and what happens to her and how it affects the other characters in the novel. Yukiko, 30 and still unmarried, shy and retiring, now not much sought after. So many proposals for her have been refused in earlier years that the family has acquired a reputation for haughtiness, even though its fortunes are declining. Hmm. And the fourth sister, Teiko, often called Koi-san, willful and sophisticated beyond her 25 years, waiting impatiently for Yukiko's marriage so that her own secret liaison can be acknowledged before the world. So those are the four sisters and their primary situation. Much of what most of the book revolves around is Yukiko needs a husband. She is over 30. She has remained unmarried far too long. And yes, like it says in the introduction to her character, that perhaps in the past they were a bit more choosy than they might have been otherwise. Because what we will come to know very quickly is that the Makioka family, it was a family with wealth and some social influence and money. They, they were a rich family. Daughter one gets married, daughter two gets married, and now Yukiko, for some reason, is having a hard time getting married. This is very inconvenient to the fourth daughter, Teiko, because she has a boyfriend and they would like to get married. They would like to start living their lives, but they can't because society doesn't allow daughter number four to get married before daughter number three. So Teiko is in a very frustrating spot through most of the novel. And there's one other thing that it is, this is quite significant to the story, that the two younger daughters, Yukiko and Teiko, they live with daughter number two. They live with Sachiko. They don't live with daughter number one, Tsuruko. And it is, it is stated, it is written, it is insinuated. The two younger daughters prefer living with Sachiko because they don't get along very well with Tsuruko's husband. They're not really a big fan of their brother-in-law. So they prefer to live with Sachiko, and they find her husband more agreeable to live with. As well, daughter number one, uh, Tsuruko, has many children. Sachiko has one daughter. So that if the daughter, you know, if, see, it's already getting so complicated. If Yukiko and Teiko were to go to the main house, they would be lost in a sea of children and chores and duties and all of that stuff. So they, 
prefer living with their sister in Ashia in relative calm. And that is the story of the Makioka sisters. There is this constant story of Yukiko being made to meet with these eligible bachelors to see if they can decide if that would be a good match for them. And there's always a lot of wrangling because Yukiko is very beautiful, she's very delicate, she's very, she's actually extremely shy. And throughout the novel, she says very little, actually. Most of the characters have to speak on her behalf because she is so shy. We need to get a husband for our shy, beautiful sister. Hopefully we, we can do it quickly so that the youngest sister can get on with her life and she can finally get married to her boyfriend and, you know, stop being the cause of, you know, scandalous gossip. And so does anything happen in the book aside from these little marriage dinners and rendezvous? No, that's all. That very, very little in terms of action happens in the novel. The world is heading towards the Second World War, that that is mentioned occasionally here and there about oh, the situation in England and Germany. There's always that to the audience, a bit of the fear and the horror that see all of the all of the characters are unaware of the the devastation that the 20th century is headed towards. And so they just live their lives reading the newspapers, trying to pay attention with what's happening with the the European situation. And of course, Japan was quite active militarily at the same time. And they talk about, how is it referred to? They talk about the uh, the China crisis. I'm not a historian. I, I just read a lot of books. But Why should you read the Makioka Sisters? It moves very slowly. It is not, I don't think anyone writes books like this anymore. Like nowadays we have this hyperactive obsession with get to the action. The action drives the story. And in this novel, there is almost no action at all. Does that mean that it's not a good book or that it's hard to read? No, not at all. I loved reading this book. I was sad when I came to the end of it because it just could have gone on and on. The very little struggles within the four daughters of this family. You know, while I was reading it, I, I did ask myself, are we not too obsessed with action in today's world? Action's easy, right? Like action is exciting. It's easy to follow and it, you know, provokes well, what will happen next. You know, when, when nothing happens, you know, it's very hard to get excited. Oh, I wonder if they will have breakfast again this morning. Like it's just not as engaging, I suppose, in terms of storytelling, but I loved it. So one of the words you're going to have to get used to in this is um, mi-ai. M-I-A-I. A mi-ai, I believe, it's like a, a formal dinner with the objective of securing a marriage proposal. Yukiko, along with her older sister Sachiko, they are often setting up these meetings with their eligible bachelors. And there's just so much of this, um, oh, well, he looks a little bit old, but maybe it's not so bad. Oh, maybe it will be bad because he looks so old and Yukiko looks so young and they won't look good together. But he is wealthy, so that's important. And then there was another man and, oh, well, this man wasn't such a good match because he was married and he already had children and those children are still alive and so that will make things complicated if they were to get married. Just one of the funny bits that I really enjoyed. They decided that this one gentleman wasn't good enough for sweet Yukiko, that he was not interesting enough or he was a bit dull, he wasn't much of a conversationalist and so he wanted to get married to her but the, the family decided no. So then there's this bit here that I just, I thought it was fantastic. So Sachiko as she had planned earlier, left Mrs. Jimba to infer that the refusal had come from the main house. Upon her return, she told Yukiko only that things had been settled amicably, and Yukiko asked for no details. Some days later, as the doll festival approached, a note came from Jimba enclosing the bill from the Peking and asking that they pay for half of it. So they went on a date with this bachelor, him thinking that he's going to make a proposal and he, he might get a new beautiful young wife, and then when the Makioka family rejects him, sends them the bill for the dinner and requests that he be reimbursed for the half of the money that was spent for that night. And they pay it. It is hard to know culturally, but I think it is rarely acceptable in any culture to, to have dinner. And then a few days later, you, you send the bill and you ask for money to reimburse you. He was expecting to get a wife, but um, to ask for the money back is really stingy. In Japanese culture, the first 
son becomes the head of the first house. The first son will live with the parents and they will supporting each other financially. That is the main house. Now, depending, of course, on how many other children the family has, if they have two sons, then the second son leaves and he sets up secondary branch of the family. Whenever major decisions are to be made, it is expected that the secondary branch will consult with the main house about, especially in this novel, about marriage proposals. Should we accept or should we decline based on this information? And the main house will send their suggestion and the suggestion should always be followed because it comes from the main house. So what happens if, as in this novel, there are no sons and there are four daughters? The first daughter, Tsuruko, she, she will be the head of the main house. For any Westerners, what I'm about to say next might sound like perfect witchcraft, but in Japan it's very common and unexceptional. If the family is powerful, because of money or some historical position that the family once occupied, it would not be unusual for a young man to marry into this family and that he would change his name to join that family. In this instance, sister number one, Tsuruko, her family name is Makioka. Her husband is Tatsuo. Tatsuo came in and he changed his name from whatever it was, to Makioka. And that way, with his marriage to her, he was becoming like the number one son, or he was the husband of the first daughter in the main house. That is not an uncommon thing in Japan, that say if you were the, the second son, or the third son, or the fourth son, and you knew that your family, you know, they would take care of number one and number two, and maybe number three, but if you were number four, there wasn't going to be a lot left to, to take care of you. And so a good way to climb the social ladder would be to marry up into a better social position. So you might go from being fourth son, you might marry up into actually being second son, but you would have to take your new family's name. Tsuruko's husband, Tatsuo, he takes the Makioka name, and even Sachiko's husband, he also takes the Makioka name because that is, well, he sees it as an advantage for him because the Makioka family were wealthy once upon a time. So that is what has happened in this book. We have the four daughters, elder two, are both married to husbands who have come in to join the Makioka family. And don't forget that the main house has to give their stamp of approval to decisions that are being made. In this novel, most of it is about who will Yukiko eventually get married, or what are we going to do about the troublesome Teiko, who she is bright, and she is restless, and she's unhappy with her situation and being forced to wait for Yukiko to get her main, to get her situation settled so that Teiko, so that she can get her life starting to move forward or move in some direction anyway. While I was reading this novel, I often thought about D.H. Lawrence, especially uh, Women in Love. There's something, there seems to be something very similar to Tanizaki's method of writing and D.H. Lawrence's style of writing. Perhaps that it, it's purely driven on simple human emotions. We, d we don't need a lot of dramatic events to, to love our literature. Of course it helps, right? We all we all love a book that the book practically takes our lives hostage while we're reading it and we just can't think of anything else. And to read this kind of a book, which is very slow and pondering, pondering? Slow and meandering, I think I mean to say. And it takes some tenacity to to read the book to the end. But I think if you do read the book to the end and you stick with it and you spend all those 530 pages with the lives of these characters. I think you're going to be rewarded greatly because you just come away with, I really truly felt I knew who these characters were and I knew about their lives and I knew about their struggles and I knew how hard it was for them to, to deal with these small familial difficulties that appear simple, but very perfect writing, storytelling. I would like to make one comment about Japanese literature because in all the Japanese literature that I've read, there's this one motif which is mentioned in every one of the Japanese books I've read. So you might think, well, what is it? Is it about family? No. Tradition? Honor? No. None of those things. It is about sweating 
every Japanese book I've read, sweating is mentioned often in a way which you wonder what it is doing there. And you may, you, you say to yourself, well, Japan is insanely hot and, you know, they must do quite a lot of sweating there. It's, it's, the humidity is awful. But do we really need these lines? You know, oh, he was sweating so badly that he had to change his shirt and have a shower and put on a fresh shirt because, you know, he'd been sweating so much. Is that something that moves the plot forward? And it's, it's mentioned many times in this book. Oh, somebody was sweating. It's just, it's there. In all of the Japanese books I have, there's always some very clear reference to someone being very sweaty. I guess it's a Japanese thing. So, The Makioka Sisters by Yunichiro Tanizaki. I highly recommend this book. I don't know, I don't know who exactly I would recommend the book to. It, for anyone out there who still has, who has the patience to wrestle with mild family drama for over 500 pages, you'll be happy you did in the end. You will be incredibly satisfied with the result. It's just that the pages don't run along very quickly. I really had to set the time aside to read this book. I had to say, all right, I want to read 50 pages a day. And when I read it in that way, when I did the 50 pages a day, it was very satisfying because I felt like I was getting a big piece of what is happening here, of the tale. So that was that was quite satisfying. Like just to read a couple of lines while I'm on, you know, waiting for the bus and then I read a couple of pages while I'm on the bus. It's not very satisfying in that way. You need to you need to take this in big doses. That's my personal feeling. I would just like to say hello to my beautiful wife, Yukari. She's in Japan right now. Hello to little Yukari, my beautiful wife. Hello, Yukari. I hope you are feeling good in Japan. I'm sorry I'm not there with you, but I, you know I have to stay here to pay for the apartment in Canada. It's really awful being here by myself. I'm so lonely. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. Sometimes when I make these videos, my nose becomes so insanely itchy. I don't know what it is. It's just like my nose is on fire. Like I was gonna make another video right now, but um, I can't do it because like, I f I'm afraid if I keep scratching my nose, it's gonna start bleeding soon because like it's so itchy and I I'm scratching it like like a fucking werewolf. It's nuts.